greetings from Florida. Um, happy Sabbath. I sure miss being there. Anyway, I've got a study to present here today. It's, it's called The Loud Cry, Who Will Proclaim It? And this is out of the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, and um, other places in the Spirit of Prophecy. And I'd like to share that with you. So can we start with prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for your Sabbath. We pray you'll bless this study. Use me, Lord, as I present this. I pray that uh, we can gain a blessing and see what's coming for us here shortly. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm used to... Uh, <clears throat> Having a dialogue where I can I, I can hear, but I'm hoping everybody there can hear me. Okay, uh, th this is from the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume Four, Chapter Thirty Three, and it's also you can find it in the Great Controversy, Chapter Thirty Eight. It's the chapter called the Final Warning, and I'm going to go ahead and read and comment as we go. It says, "I saw another angel come down from heaven." Heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the greatest fallen, has fallen, and become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. And that's out of Revelation 18, 1 and 2. Anyway, um, these other slides that are going to be in this color right here are from other parts. Um, this is from the Bible, and there'll be other parts from the Spirit of Prophecy. We know that Revelation 14.8 talks um, and says, and there followed, this is the second angel, uh, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, the great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. But it's not until we get into Revelation, it says in um, Revelation 18.1, after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice. So the strong voice doesn't attend this message until later. Uh, the first two angels, the first angel cried with a loud voice, and the third angel cries with a loud voice but not until we get into Revelation chapter 18, the second angel, the repeat of the second angel's message is given with a strong voice, voice that Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. <clears throat> we see before us a special work to be done. We are now to pray as never before for the Holy Spirit's guidance. Let us seek the Lord with the whole heart that he that we may find him. We have received the light of the three angels' messages, and we need now to come decidedly to the front and take our position on the side of truth. The 14th chapter of Revelation is a chapter of the deepest interest. This scripture will soon be understood in all its bearings. And the messages given to John, the revelator, will be repeated with distinct utterance. This is out of the Review and Herald, the chapter, uh, the closing work, or not chapter, but uh, titled The Closing Work. The prophecies in the 18th of Revelation will soon be fulfilled. During the proclamation of the third angel's message, another angel is to come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth is to be lightened with his glory. The Spirit of the Lord will uh, so graciously bless consecrated human instrumentalities that men, women, and children will open their lips in praise and thanksgiving, filling the earth with the knowledge of God and with his unsurpassed glory as the waters cover the sea. I'm looking forward to this. Those who have held the beginning of their confidence firm unto the end will be wide awake during this time, during the time that the third angel's message is proclaimed with great power. During the loud cry, the church, aided by the providential <clears throat> interpositions, 
of her exalted Lord will diffuse the knowledge of salvation so abundantly, abundantly that the light will be communicated to every city and town. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of salvation. So abundantly, abundantly will the renewing spirit of God have crowned the success that the intensity, intensely active agencies that the light of the present truth will be seen flashing everywhere. The saving knowledge of God will accomplish its purifying work on the mind and the heart of every believer. <clears throat> the word declares, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And I, I like that. It doesn't say he's going to force us. He said he would cause us to walk in his statutes. This is the descent of the Holy Spirit sent from God to do its office work. The house of Israel is to be imbued with the Holy Spirit and baptized with the grace of salvation. And I learned this uh, from, this is out of Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, these, these verses that uh, she's quoting from. <clears throat> Amid the confusing cries, lo, here is Christ, lo, there is Christ, will be born in special testimony, a special message of truth appropriate for this time, which message is to be received, believed, and acted upon. It is the truth, not fanciful ideas, that is efficacious. The eternal truth of the word will stand forth free from all seductive errors and spiritualistic interpretations, free from all fanciful, drawing, alluring pictures. God is raising up a class to give the loud cry of the third angel's message. And I believe that. I, I believe it even now, even stronger. It is Satan's object now to get up new theories to divert the mind from the true work and genuine message for this time. He stirs up minds to give false interpretation of scriptures, a spurious loud cry that the rest, I mean, that the real message may not have its effect when it does come. This is one of the greatest evidences that the loud cry will soon be heard and the earth will be lightened with the glory of God. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message. There is no other work of so in great importance they are, they are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. And that's a true statement. We've really been blindsided by this, all these other uh, things coming in and that, but uh, we are not to allow anything else to absorb our attention when it comes to giving this true message. Falsehoods will be urged upon the attention of God's people, but the truth is to stand clothed in its beautiful, pure garments. The word, precious in its holy, uplifting influence, is not to be degraded to a level with common, ordinary matters. It is always to remain uncontaminated by the fallacies by which Satan seeks to deceive, if possible, the very elect. The proclamation of the gospel is the only means in which God can employ human beings as his instrumentalities for the salvation of souls. As men, women, and children proclaim the gospel, the Lord will open the eyes of the blind to see his statutes and will write upon the hearts of the truly penitent his law. The animating spirit of God working through human agencies leads the believers to be of one mind, one soul, unitedly loving God and keeping his commandments, preparing here 
below for translation. Okay, now I'm going back to this <clears throat> uh, chapter in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, The Loud Cry. And I know I read this one already, but I'll repeat it. I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. <clears throat> okay. In this scripture, the announcement of the fall of Babylon as made by the second angel is repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. A terrible condition of the religious world is here described. With every rejection of truth, the minds of the people have become darker, darker, their hearts more stubborn until they are entrenched in an infidel hardihood. In defiance of the warnings which God has given, they continue to trample upon one of the precepts of the Decalogue, and they persecute those who hold it sacred. Christ is set at naught in the contempt placed upon his word and his people. As the teachings of spiritualism are accepted by the churches, no real restraint is imposed upon the carnal heart, and the profession of religion becomes a cloak to conceal the basis of iniquity. A belief in spiritual manifestations opens the door to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The influence of evil angels is felt in the churches throughout the land. And, you know, the SDA church has gone through the spiritual formation, contemplative prayer, and all these things, which we should have never engaged in also. <clears throat> the loud cry again, it says, uh, <clears throat> of Babylon at that time, it is declared her sins have reached unto heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. She has filled up the measure of her guilt and destruction is about to fall upon her. But God still has a people in Babylon, and before the visitation of his judgments, these faithful ones must be called out, that they, par that they partake not of her sins and receive not of her plagues. Hence, the movement symbolized by the angel coming down from heaven, lighting the earth with his glory and crying mightily with a strong voice, announcing the sins of Babylon in connection with his message, the call is heard, come out of her, my people. All these warnings join the third angel's message and swells to a loud cry. Fearful is the issue to which the world is to be fought. The powers of earth uniting to war against the commandments of God will decree that no man may buy or sell save he that has the mark of the beast and finally that whosoever refuses to receive the mark of the beast shall be put to death. The word of God declares if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. <clears throat> but none, uh, but not one is made to feel the wrath of God until the truth has been bought in contact with his mind and conscience and has been rejected. There are many in the churches of our community who have never ever in this land of light and knowledge had an opportunity to hear the special truths for this time. The obligation of the fourth commandment has never been set before them in its true light. Jesus reads the heart and tries every motive. The decree is not to be urged upon the people blindly. Every one is to have sufficient light to make um, his decision intelligently. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth, especially controverted. And we can see that that's, it's, it's happening. Um, we know God's commandments. 
and especially the fourth commandment. And you have Romans where they've actually dropped the second and split the 10. And uh, you can see in the background, the idols here up there on, on uh, in Vatican there. But the, point, the, the Pope pointing to the, the Sabbath, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. It's not the third commandment, it's the fourth. And we know uh, from his encyclical, Laudato Si, um, has to do with Sunday, Sunday worship on Sunday or participation in the Eucharist. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day of which heals our relationship with God and with others. And Sunday is the day of the resurrection, the first day. So it's, it's all to do with Sunday. And so the day of rest centered on the Eucharist, again, Sunday. So anyhow, we know what the issue is and, and in the world and even this climate summits and everything else that have happened. The Climate Sunday Coalition declared at the conclusion of uh, COP26, we have only just begun and through worship, we will work for climate justice. And what day are they promoting? It's in the back, Climate Sunday. So anyway, heretofore, those who presented the truths of this third message have been often been regarded as mere alarmists. The prediction that church and state would unite to pers persecute those who keep the commandments of God has been pronounced groundless and absurd. It has been um, confidently declared that this land could never become other than what it has been, the defender of religious freedom. But as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is widely agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching. The third message produces an effect which it could not have had before. And all we have to do is, is look at this, uh, the, the defender of religious freedom. We don't understand religious freedom. Uh, COVID-19 proved it, and you can, we, we can see what's happened as a result. So this land of boasted religious freedom, it's not happening anymore. It's going to get worse. They're taking our freedoms away all the time. In every generation, God has sent his servants to rebuke sin, both in the world and in the church. But the people desire smooth things spoken to them. And the pure, unvarnished truth is not acceptable. Many reformers, in entering upon their work, determined to exercise great prudence in attacking the sins of the church and the nation. They hope, by the example of a pure Christian life, to lead the people back to the doctrines of the Bible. But the Spirit of God came upon them as it came upon Elijah, and they could not refrain from preaching the plain utterances of the Bible, doctrines which they had been reluctant to present. <clears throat> when they were impelled to zealously declare the truth and the danger which threatened souls, the words which the Lord gave them, they uttered, fearless of consequences, and the people were compelled to hear the warning. This is going to happen again soon. I believe in my heart this is the Lord's going to be working mightily here soon. Thus, the message of the third angel, thus will the message of the third angel be proclaimed. As the time comes for the loud cry to be given, the Lord will work through humble instruments leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to his service. The laborers will be qualified rather by the unction of his spirit than by the training of literary institutions. Men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal, declaring the words which the Lord gives them. The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of a union of church and state the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power, all will be unmasked. By these solemn warnings, the people will be stirred. Thousands upon thousands have never listened to words like these. In amazement, they hear the testimony that Babylon is the church fallen because of her errors and sins. 
because of a rejection of the truth sent to her from heaven. The people are going to their former teachers with the eager inquiry. Are these things so? The, minister, the ministers present fables, prophesy smooth things to soothe their fears and quiet the awakened conscience. But many refuse to be satisfied with the mere authority of men and demand of plain, thus saith the Lord. The popular ministry, like the Pharisees of old, are filled with anger as their authority is questioned, and they denounce the message as of Satan, and stir up the sin-loving multitudes to revile and persecute those who proclaim it. As the controversy extends <clears throat> into new fields, and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan is astir. The power attending the message only maddens those who oppose it. The clergy put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light, lest it should shine upon their flocks. By every means at their command, they endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, and in this work, papists are solicited to come to the help of Protestants. And uh, the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided. The law is invoked against commandment, keeping, commandment keepers. They are threatened with fines and imprisonment, and some are offered positions of influence and other rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith. But their steadfast answer is, show us from the word of God our error. The same plea that was made by Luther under similar circumstances. Those who are arraigned before the courts make a strong vindication of the truth. And some who hear them are led to take their stand to keep all the commandments of God. Thus, light is bought before thousands who otherwise would know nothing of these truths. Conscientious obedience to the word of God will be treated as rebellion. Blinded by Satan, the parent will exercise harshness and severity toward the believing child. The master or mistress will oppose the commandment keeping servant. Affection will be given, alienated, children will be disinherited and driven from home. In other words, of Paul will be literally fulfilled. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. As the defenders of the truth refuse to honor the Sunday Sabbath, some of them will be thrust into prison, some will be exiled, some will be treated as slaves. To human wisdom, all this now seems impossible, but as the restraining spirit of God shall be withdrawn from men, they shall be under the control of Satan, who hates the divine precepts. There will be a strong, uh, there will be strange developments. The heart can be very cruel when God's fear and love are removed. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third message, but have not been sanctified through it, abandon the position and take refuge under the banner of, of the powers of darkness. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is bought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. And this kind of reminds me of what happened in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 66. It's ironic that man numbers the Bible. But anyway, I'm going to read this other part here, and then I'll read something from Desire of Ages. It says, Men of Talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are bought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. Okay, so John 6, 66 says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Um, the spirit of prophecy commenting on this, she says, As those 
disaffected disciples turned away from Christ, a different spirit took control of them. They could see nothing attractive in him who they had once found so interesting. They sought out his enemies, for they were in harmony with their spirit and work. They misrepresented his words, falsified his statements, and impunged his motives. They sustained their course by gathering up every item that could be turned against him. And such indignation was stirred up by these false reports that his life was in danger. It's, you know, history repeats. It, it's, it's amazing. It sounds almost we're reading parallel, but uh, what it says right here, you know, they, uh, they haven't been sanctified through it and they abandoned their position and uh, they leave. Sad. Okay, let's see. The Lord's servants have faithfully given warning, looking to God and to his word alone. They have not coldly cal calculated the consequences to themselves. They have not consulted their temporal interests or sought to preserve their reputation or their lives. Yet when the storm of opposition and reproach burst upon them, they are overwhelmed with consternation. And some are ready to exclaim, had we foreseen the consequences of our words, we would have held our peace. They are hedged in with difficulties. Satan assails them with fierce temptations. The work which they had have undertaken seems far beyond their ability to accomplish. They are threatened with destruction. The enthusiasm which animated them is gone, yet they cannot turn back. Then, feeling their utter, utter helplessness, they flee to the Mighty One for strength. They remember that the words which they have spoken were not theirs, but his who bade them give the warning. God put forth the truth into their hearts, and they could not forbear to proclaim it. Lord, help us. The same trials <clears throat> were experienced by the men of God in ages past. Wycliffe, Huss, Luther, Tyndale, Baxter, Wesley urged that all doctrines be bought to the test of the Bible and declared that they would renounce everything which it condemned. Against these men, persecution raged with relentless fury, yet they ceased not to declare the truth. Different periods in the history of the church have each been marked by the developments of some special truth adapted to the necessities of the people of God at that time. Every new truth has made its way against hatred and opposition. Those who were blessed with its light were tempted and tried. The Lord gives a special truth for the people in an emergency. Who dare refuse to publish it? He commands his servants to present the last invitation of mercy to the world. They cannot remain silent except at the peril of their souls. Christ's ambassadors have nothing to do with consequences. They must perform their duty and leave the results with God. Amen. As the opposition rises to a fiercer height, the servants of God are again perplexed, for it seems to them that they have bought the crisis. But conscience and the word of God assure them that their course is right. And although the trials continue, they are strengthened to bear them. The contest grows closer and sharper, but their faith and courage rise with the emergency. Their testimony is, we dare not tamper with God's word, dividing his holy law, calling one portion essential and another non-essential to gain the favor of the world. The Lord whom we serve is able to deliver us. And I like that. Where have we heard that before? Does that sound familiar? Uh, the three Hebrew uh, worthies. Christ has conquered the powers of earth. And shall we be afraid of a world already conquered? And I'm putting this in here because Daniel 3.17, 
They answer, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. So we know that God will deliver his people also in the end. Persecution in its varied forms is the development of a principle which will exist as long as Satan is, exists. And Christianity has vital power. No man can serve, <coughs> excuse me, no man can serve God without enlisting against himself the opposition of the host of darkness. Evil angels will assail him, alarmed that his influence is taking the prey from their hands. Evil men rebuked by his example will unite with them in seeking to separate him from God by alluring temptations. When these do not succeed, then a compelling power is employed to force the conscience. But as long as Jesus remains man's intercessor in the sanctuary above, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is felt by the rulers and people. It still controls to some extent the laws of the land were it not for these laws, the condition of the world would be much worse than it is now. While many of our rulers are active agents of Satan, God also has his agents among the leading men of the nation. And I'm thankful for that. The enemy moves upon his servants to propose measures that would greatly impede the work of God. But state, statesmen who fear the Lord are influenced by the holy angels to oppose such propositions with unanswerable arguments. Thus, a few men will hold in check a power current of evil. The opposition of the enemies of truth will be restrained that the third message may do its work. When the loud cry shall be given, it will arrest the attention of these leading men through whom the Lord is now working, and some of them will accept it and will stand with the people of God through the time of trouble. The angel who unites, the angel who unites in the proclamation of the third message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory, a work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here brought to view. The Advent movement of 1840 through 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first message was carried to every missionary station in the world and is, and in this country, there <clears throat> was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed in many lands since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be far exceeded by the mighty movement under the loud cry of the third angel. And I can't even imagine that, but I'm looking forward to it. And I'm just amazed even right now that, like I said, we're 2,500 miles apart and, and I can be fellowshipping there with you today through, you know, the internet here. It's amazing. The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining from <clears throat> shining with holy consecration, hasten from place to place to proclaim the warning from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the message will be given. Miracles are wrought, the sick are healed, and signs and wonders follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Thus the inhabitants of the earth are bought to take their stand. And I, I'm thinking about words. It says, servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration. I think about, you know, the time when Moses um, came down from the mount and it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables, the testimony in, uh, in Moses' hand, uh, when he came down from the mount that Moses was not at the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. I, th I think uh, God's servants will have that shining also. The message will be carried as was the midnight cry of 1844, not so much by argument as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. The arguments have been presented 
The seed has been sown, and now it will spring up and bear fruit. The publications distributed by missionary workers have, been, have exerted their influence, yet many whose minds have been impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness, and the honest children of God sever the bands which have held them. Family connections, church relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. And uh, th this is the end of th the reading of this uh, particular chapter. I want to share some things here um, that are happening that shouldn't be happening in our church, uh, the, the conference in throughout the world, we, we've been raised to give a, a special message. And I, I believe that it's time that we step up and, and do as God has called. And I believe he'll bless as we do it. Handing out literature, uh, great controversies, national Sunday laws, whatever we can do. And uh, anyway, I've put this part. It says how the general conference is helping to heal the deadly wound. You know, they're going to wait, I guess, um, Ted Wilson said they want to wait till uh, 2024 to start handing out the great controversy. And I'm wondering why do we want to wait that long? We should be doing it now. And <clears throat> we need to go back to the symbol that God's given us and get rid of this Catholic symbol with the upside down cross. It says, are the prophecies of Revelation conditional? Revelation 13.3, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered. And the word wondered is to, to admire after the beast. They're holding, holding him in admiration. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it's a sad day when we can't even display the symbol on our churches or buildings or in any of our literature of the three angels without being attacked from the conference or, um, you know, we, we should be able to use the symbol. I want you to now see verse 29. Let me go back here. Let me set up this. Uh, I'm not going to name names who, who this pastor was, but this was a message that I heard recently in a church and um, I was a little bit distraught by it. I, and uh, I'll let you hear it here. I want you to now see verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. Have you folks ever heard of the stars falling from heaven? When did it happen? Oh my goodness. Thank you, brother. You nailed it. 1833. Absolutely. Now I want you to see this. Look at this now. Back at verse 29. The stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Watch verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Friends, we are living between verse 29 and verse 30 today. Take note. We are living literally between those two verses. The events of those two verses. Our friends, this is beautiful. The prophecies have been fulfilled. We have every reason to expect Jesus at any moment. It would be a mistake to predict, oh no, this has to happen first, and then this has to happen, and then that has to happen. You know, the evangelists and the prophets want to tell us what the, the signs of the end are going to be. They want to tell us how to line up our lives, and I'm not going to discredit them here, but friends, Jesus is not beholden to what we think will happen in the last day. He can come at any moment. He can come anytime he wants. If ever we studied the Bible, we would know that some prophecies are conditional. Some are absolutely fulfilled, and yet there are some in the Old Testament that never happened because the conditions changed in Israel. Some of those prophecies are in the book of Ezekiel. Some of them are in Jeremiah. Friends, it may be true in the last days. Jesus may come at any time. And so let us not take the position that 
okay, no, this has to happen first. And then when that happens, that's when I'll start getting my life together. What am I talking about, church? What am I talking about? You know, as well as I do, that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has markers, just theological markers, where we say to ourselves, well, when this happens, then we know this is going to happen. Well, friends, those things may indeed happen. But let us not in. That's not what Anyway, and I've, I think I've shared this with you before there, and this has been out, but Ellen White's style of prophecy is classical rather than apocalyptic. And finally, as a classical prophet, Ellen White's prediction should be understood as conditional as circumstances change. The fulfillment of Revelation 13 could take other forms than the ones that seemed so clear in 1888. And I like what she wrote in first selected messages. It said a system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. And I, I'm sure a lot of people living in the area there know who uh, John Pauline is. And, and it's, it's a sad day in Adventism when they discredit the prophet, they discredit the prophecies. And uh, I just, I can't believe the, the things that we're hearing from our pulpits nowadays and from men that should know better. I like the, what the prophet shared here in, in uh, manuscript release uh, 15. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before, probate, before probation closes, for it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. So they're discrediting what she's saying also. <clears throat> Some prophecies are conditional. I don't believe uh, um, that the book of Revelation is conditional. I believe there has been conditional prophecies. Um, the, the, uh, the story of Jonah is one of them. Uh, the Lord himself revealed to his servant John the mysteries of the book of Revelation and designs that they shall be open to the study of all. In this book are depicted scenes that are now in the past and some of eternal interest are taking place around us. Other of its prophecies will not receive their complete fulfillment until the close of time, when the last great conflict between the powers of darkness and the Prince of Heaven will take place. The most solemn truths ever entrusted to mortals have been given us to proclaim to the world. The proclamation of these truths is to be our work. The world is to be warned, and God's people are to be true to the trust committed to them. They are not to engage in speculation. And some of these sermons and some of these things that they're saying, that is, it's mere speculation and even worse. Neither are they to enter into business enterprises with unbelievers, for this would hinder them in God's given work, in their God-given work. So Jesus can return at any moment. Things have to happen. Revelation has to play out. The third angel's message is given with power. The power of procl uh, proclamation of the first, second, and second messages is to be intensified in the third. In, Revelation, in the Revelation, John says the heavenly messenger who unite with the third angel, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was light with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice. We are in danger of giving the third angel's message in so indefinite a matter that it does not impress the people. So many other interests are bought in that the very message which should be proclaimed with power becomes tame and voiceless. At our camp meetings, a mistake has been made. The Sabbath question has been touched upon, but has not been presented as the great test of this time. While the churches profess to believe in Christ, they are vital, violating the law which Christ himself proclaimed from Sinai. The Lord bids us show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. The trumpet is to give a certain sound. So the only thing that's changed, actually, the conditions in the SDA leadership have changed. The message hasn't changed. And, uh, you know, 
I don't know what business we have even having our religious liberty man, uh, Ganon Diop, even visiting the Vatican. What do we have to gain by that? It says, Rome never changes, she claims, infallibility. It is Protestantism that will change. The, adop the adoption of liberal ideas on its part will bring it where it can clasp the hands of Catholicism. And uh, you can see that this is basically coming true with what they're doing right here. Why, why are they clasping the hands of Catholicism? Why are, it, why are they even over there? And, of course, this statement, we are to avoid the mark of the beast, false worship on a day other than the seventh day. The prophet clearly states, when the test comes, it will be clearly shown what the mark of the beast is. It is the keeping of Sunday. And we don't need this kind of confusion, false worship on a, a day other than the seventh day. And uh, I've used this one there before. I know my wife, this is one of her favorites. Uh, Ted, why can't you just say Sunday? <clears throat> but they're drunk with Babylon's wine here, you know. We are to avoid the mark of the beast, Tom Pauline statements. The biblical evidence does not speak of Sunday as such. And Pope Francis is saying, keep drinking, boys, you're doing great. They're drinking of Babylon's wine. At one time, I guess Ted Wilson could say Sunday because in 2018, Ted Wilson said no Sunday law in the pipeline. I guess he failed to see that uh, Laudato C came out in 2015 and uh, <clears throat> the encyclical right there in 2015, uh, why would he say in 2018 that there's no Sunday law in the pipeline? And of course, we know the statement given by uh, Neil Wilson, although it is true that there was a period in the life of the Seventh-day Adventist Church when the denomination took a distinctly anti-Roman Catholic viewpoint. That attitude on the church's part was nothing more than a manifestation of widespread anti-popery among conservative Protestant denominations in the early part of the century and the latter part of the last and which has now been consigned to the historical trash heap so far as Seventh-day Adventist Church is concerned. And this had to do with a lawsuit that, uh, and this was back in 1974, 75. Anyway, and, and we have these kind of statements now. This is an Adventist uh, today, um, postmodernism. The world has changed, so must the message. <clears throat> it says, that is the world's uh, truth right now. The postmodern world has arrived. What does a potential Sunday law have to do with these needs? Perhaps we can stop emphasizing the de details of Revelation and Daniel. These aren't relevant to the new apocalyptic postmodernism. They are still important to the church's identity, but the emphasis now must be to bring Jesus in a relevant way to the new generations of the 21st century. Every window doctrine. So <clears throat> I have had precious opportunities to obtain an experience. I have had an experience in the first, second, and third angels' messages the angels are represented as, represented as flying in the midst of heaven, proclaiming to the world a message of warning and having a distinct bearing upon the people living in the last days of this earth's history. No one hears the voice of these angels, for they are a symbol to represent the people of God who are working in harmony with the universe of heaven. Men, women, men and women enlightened by the Spirit of God and sanctified through the truth proclaim the three angels' messages in their order. And again, why have they taken away our symbol, the symbol that represents the, the people of God working in harmony with heaven? Uh, there's churches now that are putting them back. I'm thankful the church I attend here in Florida has this, but they had to have it trademarked um, to be able to put this um, the three angels up on their church. 
so that uh, the conference can't uh, mess with them. And they used something slightly different than the original, but it, it shouldn't be happening. I should be able to use this symbol. Christ says of his people, you are the light of the world. <clears throat> it is not a small matter that the counsels and plans of God have been so clearly open to us. It is a wonderful privilege to be able to understand the will of God as revealed in the sure word of prophecy. The issues, I mean, that this places on us a heavy responsibility. God expects us to impart to others the knowledge that he has given us. It is his purpose that the divine and human instrumentalities shall unite in the proclamation of the morning message. So far as his opportunities extend, everyone who has received the light of truth is under the same responsibility as was the prophet of Israel to whom came the word, Son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, Thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Are we to wait until the fulfillment of the prophecies of the end before we say anything concerning them? Of what value will our words be then? Shall we wait until God's judgments fall upon the transgressor before we tell him how to avoid them? Where is our faith in the word of God? Must we see things foretold come to pass before we will believe what he has said. In clear, distinct rays, light has come to us, showing us that the great day of the Lord is near at hand, even at the doors. Let us read and understand before it is too late. Let us seek the Lord with our whole hearts, that we may find him. We have received the light of the three angels' messages, and we need to come decidedly to the front and take our position on the side of truth. God has not passed his people by and chosen one solitary man here and another there as the only ones worthy to be entrusted with his truth. He does not give one man new light contrary to the established faith of the body. And every reformed men have arisen making this claim. Let none be self-confident as though God hath given them special light above their brethren. So, and I've also read that any new light or any light that comes will be in harmony with the light already given. It will not supersede it or detract from it or, or make it of none effect. So all new light, any light will be in harmony with the light that God has already given us. One accepts some new light an original idea which does not seem to conflict with the truth. He dwells upon it until it seems to him to be clothed with beauty and importance. For Satan has power to give this false appearance. At last it becomes the all-absorbing theme, the one great point around which everything centers, and the truth is uprooted from the heart. I warn you to beware of these side issues whose tendency is to divert the mind from the truth. Error is never harmless. It never sanctifies, but always brings confusion and dissension. And we don't need to be listening to error. We're not obligated to hear it. And when we do hear it, we need to um, rebuke it in a right manner, in a loving manner. Our warfare is aggressive. Tremendous issues are before us, yea, and right upon us. Let our prayers ascend to God that the four angels may be commissioned to hold the four winds that they may not blow to injure or destroy until the last warning has been given to the world. Then let us work in harmony with our prayers. Let there be nothing in any of our institutions that will lessen the force of the truth for this time. Present truth, present truth is to be our burden 
a great work is to be done. The third angel's message must do its work of separating from the churches a people who will take their stand on the platform of eternal truth. Our message is life and death message, and we have, must let it appear as it is, the great power of God. We are to present it in all its telling force. Then the Lord will make it effectual. It is our privilege to expect large things, even the demonstration of the Spirit of God. This is the power that will convict and convert the soul. The Sabbath question is a test that will come to the whole world. We need nothing to come in now to make a test for God's people that shall make more severe for them the test that they have already they have already have. The enemy would be pleased to get up issues now to divert the minds of the people and get them into controversy. We have now the most solemn important test given to us from the Word of God. For this special period of time, the test is for the whole world. The Lord does not require that any test of human inventions shall be bought in to divert the minds of the people or create controversy in any line. God's tests are now to stand out plain and unmistakable. There are storms before us, conflicts of which few dream. Nothing should come in to divert our minds from the great Grand, grand test, which is to decide the eternal destiny of a world, the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus. So the Sabbath of the fourth commandment is the test for this time, and therefore all connected with this great memorial is to be kept before the people. And uh, as we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies relating to the last days, especially the man of study, the last book of the New Testament scriptures is full of truth, and we need to understand. We need to understand. Satan has blinded the minds of many so that they have been glad of any excuse for not making the revelation their study. But Christ, through his servant John, has here declared what shall be in the last days. And he says, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep the things which are written therein. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. Here are the times of refreshing to which the Apostle Peter looked forward when he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of the refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus. God is raising up a class to give the loud cry of the third angel's message. It is Satan's object now to get new ther theories to divert the mind from the true work and genuine message for this time. He stirs up minds to give false interpretation of scripture, a spurious loud cry, that the real message may not have its effect when it does come. This is one of the greatest evidences that the loud cry will soon be heard and the earth will be lightened with the glory of the Lord. And we know that if they can change the symbol, they change the message. And uh, anyway, I want to end there on that. And uh, I hope you were blessed. I, I hope I wasn't boring just reading here, but I, I found that uh, chapter of the uh, Spirit of Prophecy chorus, Spirit of Prophecy Volume 4, um, the loud cry, which is also the uh, the final warning in the great controversy, I find it very interesting. And, and as I read it, I just think that we are so close right now to seeing things happen. And I just pray that God will find us all faithful and give us opportunities to just proclaim the marvelous truths that He has given us to the world and uh, with handing out literature or small sermons, whatever we can do. So anyway, um, 
thank you. And are you there, Brother Harold? Uh, well, okay. Would you like to have a word of prayer for all of us and I invite the congregation to kneel? Okay. Yes. Let's let's have a closing prayer. <clears throat> I'm gonna. I won't be able to kneel because I'll be off the off the thing here. Heavenly Father, Lord, <clears throat> thank you so much for the truth that you have preserved. And Lord, we're especially thankful for the prophet that you sent to keep us in the way, Lord. We're thankful for the instruction given through the spirit of prophecy. And Lord, I wanna pray for these people that are misleading um, our churches with their wrong messages, uh, with the apostasy, which, what, what, uh, what they're doing. Lord, I pray that you'll bring the spirit of conviction upon them or remove them out of their positions, Lord, and put men of um, responsibility in their place that will not fear to do the work that we've been called to do. Lord, we look forward to your soon coming. We know it can't be much longer. Things are happening in this world. Uh, this COVID, we're moving past it, but now the, the crisis um, in, in Russia, Ukraine, um, the effect of the gas prices, all these things, Lord, um, you know, they're the beginning of the sorrows, but yet this message needs to go forward. Lord, help us all to be found faithful in doing our part in reaching out and doing what we can to make a difference. Lord, give us the strength, give us the courage, and Lord, just we pray that you will preserve this truth and help us to go forward and help us to be partakers to be able to uh, proclaim this final warning, the loud cry. We thank you and uh, pray that you will continue to bless in Jesus' name. Amen.